For the first time since Saladin's crushing victory over the Latins in 1187, Christendom had achieved a decisive victory in the field at Asaf. However, while the Sultan's losses had been significant and put him on the back foot, they were by no means decisive. As the Crusaders, under their leader Richard the Lionheart, now sought to capitalize on their success, Saladin turned to new tactics which would present even more challenges. Would the Christian forces recapture their holy city of Jerusalem? Welcome to our concluding video on the Third Crusade and the Battle of Jaffa. After the Ayyubid Sultan's second crushing defeat against the Third Crusade at Asaf, he had to make a difficult decision. Retreating to the south, much depleted, he could not afford to defend both Ascalon and Jerusalem itself. Showing his willingness to quickly change tactics and not having much choice, he decided to utterly demolish Ascalon, southern Palestine's main port and the gateway to Egypt, so the Crusaders could not use it. Instead, he would focus on Jerusalem with his entire force. Rumours of the destruction reached the Crusaders in Jaffa by September 12th, and Richard quickly sent representatives by sea to confirm the act. It was true. Columns of inhabitants were forcefully moved from the city, and its fortifications were entirely destroyed. Having tried and failed to beat the Crusaders in open battle, Saladin would now adopt defensive scorched earth tactics. This prompted action in the Crusader camp. Richard himself wanted to seize and then re-fortify Ascalon for use as a supply, communication and staging hub to take Jerusalem, and to further destabilize Saladin's hold over Palestine. However, when his council met in mid-September, a large number of Latin nobles resisted, such as Hugh of Burgundy. They argued instead for the further re-fortification of Jaffa, followed by a direct strike in land on Jerusalem itself. Finally pressured by his crusader kin, the Lionheart was essentially forced to accede. At this point, the crusader army, tired by the horrors of the march from Acre, now basked in the sudden break in hostility and, as many Christian eyewitnesses observed, was polluted by sin and filth. The Third Crusade therefore remained stalled in and around Jaffa for seven weeks, giving Saladin time to demolish the key forts between that city and Jerusalem, further expanding his scorched earth strategy. Richard spent all of October 1191 reorganizing his spent army. Only in the last days of the normal fighting season did they advance inland on the Holy City, leaving the plentiful coastal supply line which had done so well keeping the army alive. The recent shift in Ayyubid's strategy left the path inland to Jerusalem from the coast utterly desolate. Every major fortified site was dismantled and all resources of potential use by Crusader forces were burned. Nevertheless, on October 29th, Richard marched out onto the plains east of Jaffa and began the slow, steady work of rebuilding a string of sites through which to advance on Jerusalem itself. During this period, the war degenerated into a series of skirmishes, during which the Saracen light troops and cavalry would harass the Franks and their construction efforts while avoiding a full-scale confrontation. The Lionheart would often throw himself into the thick of these battles, apparently to the irritation of his fellow commanders, who worried for the fate of the Crusade if he were to die. His martial endeavours and construction were, however, just two factors in a combined strategy. He also used diplomacy alongside military threat, probably hoping to bring Saladin to the point of submission before he had to make the siege of Jerusalem itself. Acceding to these requests, the Sultan granted permission to his brother, Safadin to hold talks on his own initiative, believing his army to be mutinous and war-weary whilst also playing for time. What followed was a series of spying episodes and sabotage between the two sides. For example, Saladin employed 300 Bedouin thieves to perform prisoner snatches at night while Richard employed religious pilgrims to covertly steal crucial information. 
the king even offered Safadin the hand of his own sister in marriage, professing that the new couple could rule over a neutral kingdom centered on Jerusalem. Despite his efforts, Safadin professed that Islam would not relinquish the holy city, so Richard had to advance further inland. By early November 1191, Crusader engineers had successfully re-fortified and reconstructed the region of Yasso for use as a base, and they subsequently moved on to the area around Lida and Ramla, both of which had been desolated by Saladin before he had retreated. As the process of rebuilding Ramla commenced, the ravaging winter began and conditions became appalling. The Crusaders suffered from malnourishment and starvation, and many horses perished. Despite these dire circumstances, the morale of the Christians was high as they were buoyed by a desire to see and regain the holy city for their faith. Six miserable winter weeks were spent reconstructing Ramla before the Lionheart's forces began to inch forward again first to Latrun and then to a small destroyed fortress near Beit Nuba. At this point, the Crusaders were now just 12 miles from Jerusalem, the ultimate goal. They were so close, however things now took an unexpected turn. Though they had come so far, a council convened on the 10th of January 1192 came to the conclusion that, instead of advancing and besieging the Holy City, the Crusaders should retreat from Beit Nuba back to the coast. It is said that the Templars and some Latin nobles coerced Richard into this, but he himself probably was not willing to stake the fate of the entire Third Crusade on such a potentially hazardous campaign. Conducting a siege on Jerusalem, with shaky supply lines while a large Saracen field army could be waiting to strike, was incredibly risky. Many scholars have commended this decision, However, some also believe that he missed out on a golden opportunity to take the city if he had only pressured Saladin further. While the king's cautious strategy was wise in hindsight, its effect on Christian morale and the crusade in general was a catastrophe. They had been so close and they had fled in disgrace, so they thought. Predictably, as the demoralized crusading army withdrew back to the coast, it began to fray and split. Some units returned to Jaffa, while others went to Acker's pleasure houses. Richard himself led a severely weakened contingent to the ruined city of Ascalon, arriving on January 20th. He would spend five months repairing the devastated coastal city. To the north, enduring divisions among the Franks would erupt in late February when the Latins openly began fighting over the recently conquered Acre. Genoese sailors under direction from Conrad of Montferrat attempted to take control of the city, but were stopped by Richard's Pisan allies. Enraged by this attempted betrayal, Richard travelled north to a place halfway between Acre and Tyre in order to meet with Conrad, but no agreement was reached. Richard subsequently formally deprived Conrad of his share of Jerusalem's revenues. However, he was now thoroughly entrenched in the Levant, with possession of an unassailable center of power at Tyre and a growing body of support among the Outremer's remaining barons. His marriage to Isabella of Jerusalem also gave him a strong claim to the throne. It seemed that Richard would have to accept the status quo, that Conrad would have to be accommodated in any lasting settlement. Crusader politics would continue to be affected in paradigm-shifting ways, as in mid-April of 1192, envoys from Europe had sailed to Ascalon, bearing news which would overturn all of the Lionheart's plans. A developing political crisis was occurring in the Angevin realm. The king's aide and representative had been exiled by Richard's brother, the future king, John Lackland, who sought to increase his own authority. Realizing he was running out of time, Richard judged he could embark on one last fighting season before returning home. Now suddenly in the mood to compromise, the king approved a decision to offer the Kingdom of Jerusalem to Conrad of Montferrat in a stunning turnaround. The previous king, Guy of Lusignan, would be compensated with the island of Cyprus, 
sold to him at a bargain price by the Templar Order, which itself had purchased it from Richard. This settlement would lead to over a century of Lusignan rule on Cyprus. Ecstatic at the sudden promotion, Conrad immediately began to make military preparations to assist Richard in his future crusading endeavours, breaking off his previous negotiations with Saladin. In the evening of April 28th, the new King of Jerusalem travelled to the residence of a fellow crusader in Tyre to have supper, where the two struck up a friendship. However, while he was travelling home with two guards, a man approached Conrad with a letter and offered it to him. As he reached out to take it, the man stabbed him, and he perished soon after. His assassins were shortly revealed to have been sent by Sinan, the master of the Nazara Ismaili, otherwise known as the Order of Assassins, from Masyaf Castle. Some of the French crusaders in Tyre spread rumours that Richard the Lionheart himself had ordered the murder, while others speculated that Saladin had contracted the assassins. It is not out of the question that Sinan simply acted independently, either in response to Tyrian piracy, or fearing that Conrad would destroy the crucial power balance in Palestine. His death sent the political situation amongst the Latins into disarray, and several attempts were made to seize power in Tyre. The widowed Isabella of Jerusalem fended off several of these attempts, and eventually a settlement was reached in which Count Henri of Champagne would marry Isabella and was elected the titular monarch of Frankish Palestine. To the south, the Lionheart set about bolstering his foothold in southern Palestine by completing the refortification of Ascalon and sought to expand it further by conquering the Muslim-held fortress of Darum. On May 29th, bad news was to come. Another messenger arrived from Europe, confirming his worst fears that Philippe Augustus, King of France, was plotting with the ambitious Prince John. The envoy warned Richard that if nothing was done to stop the treacherous duo, the kingdom might be lost to him. A decision now loomed over the Lionheart to remain in the crusade or go home immediately. He chose to remain for now. On June 6th, Saladin received an urgent warning that a crusader army was marching northeast from Ascalon in strength, which heralded another advance on Jerusalem. The prospect of attacking the Holy City was still almost insurmountable, however the stable summer weather, in addition to the network of previously reconstructed fortifications, would make things much easier. Nevertheless, Richard was not happy, and was more eager to attack Egypt, which was an easier target, and the wealthy core of Ayyubid territory. Though this likely would have been strategically wiser, it ignored the prime motivating and unifying factor of the crusade, religious zeal for Jerusalem. Crusader opinion was beginning to turn against Richard, and the Latin barons decided to march on Jerusalem with or without the Angevin king. Without much choice, the king eventually acquiesced to these demands and decided to once again advance into Judea. Though the crusaders advanced as one, Grievous fissures were beginning to appear in the Christian command structure, which was to have fatal consequences. The second advance was initially rapid. They reached Beit Nuba in a blistering six days, whereas before it had taken months. Initial success gave way to a stalling march, as Saladin consistently launched cavalry raids to destroy Christian supply caravans. On June 24th, the Christians scored a crucial victory. After stalking a crucial and massive Muslim supply caravan bound for Jerusalem for three days, Richard seized it and its cargo of food supplies, gold, silver, silks and its pack animals. After this disaster, the Sultan began preparing Jerusalem for a siege, reinforcing its walls, assigning battle positions and poisoning the wells. Five years to the day after Saladin's glorious victory at Hattin, however, a miracle came upon Islam. The Crusaders once again struck camp, turned their backs on the Holy City, and retreated. Division in the Latin army, and the fact that Richard never wanted to attack Jerusalem, considering it unwise, had prompted this withdrawal. 
By summer of 1192, both the Ayyubids and the Crusaders had fought one another to a stalemate. With the forces of neither Christendom nor Islam able to decisively win the Levantine War, all that remained was to settle peace. Aiming to seize a stronger negotiating position, Saladin launched a surprise attack on Jaffa during July of 1192 while Richard was away in Acre, preparing to attack Beirut. Seven to 10,000 Saracens, most of whom were cavalry, besieged the coastal city and took its garrison by surprise. They resisted heroically for three days, throwing back assault after assault, but then they retreated back to the citadel and left the town itself to Saladin. Crucially, the Crusader defenders managed to send word of their situation to Richard. In Acre, Richard quickly assembled a ragtag army of 54 mounted knights, several hundred infantry, and over 2,000 Genoese and peace and crossbowmen, and set sail to Jaffa. Upon seeing the Muslim banners waving from the walls, the king initially believed Jaffa to be lost. However, a defender managed to swim to the flagship and inform Richard of the citadel's resistance. Again showing his military prowess, Richard the Lionheart leapt into the sea and waded through the shallows in order to reach the shore at the head of his army. Shocked by the brazen assault, and afraid that this was just the spearhead of a far larger force, the Muslims panicked and routed, spilling out of Jaffa in a disorderly manner where many were killed in the retreat. Saladin struggled to maintain control of his army at this point, and could not bring them to order until they were five miles inland. When he did, he also received reports that more Frankish crusaders were marching from Caesarea to reinforce it. This prompted him to counterattack once again, aiming to recapture the city before reinforcements arrived. In the early morning of August 4th, the Muslim army concealed itself in the crop field fields outside the city, planning to launch a surprise attack the next day. This was not to be, as a Genoese soldier out for a morning stroll found the Muslim army and alerted his comrades. At this, Richard quickly assembled his infantry and crossbowmen for battle outside the city. The spearmen were ordered to drive their shields and spears into the ground, forming a makeshift bristling wall. Meanwhile, the large tent spikes were driven into the ground to act as anti-cavalry stakes. The small handful of cavalry Richard possessed were kept in the rear as a reserve. Saladin's lightly armoured Turkic, Egyptian and Bedouin cavalry charged at the makeshift defences of the Lionheart's line. It was then that the Crusaders implemented their intuitive tactic. The armoured crossbowmen fired their missiles in volleys, one rank shooting while the other reloaded, resulting in a constant barrage of bolts. With the lightly armoured Ayyubid horsemen being utterly savaged by crossbow bolts in their repeated charges, and unable to break through the Lionheart's innovative defences, they suffered immense losses. Meanwhile, the Crusaders' heavier armour was all but immune to Muslim arrows. After many attempted charges, the Muslim horsemen were tired and disorganised. The Lionheart used this moment to charge with his cavalry reserve, crushing the weakened Saracens, who proceeded to retreat from Jaffa. This was the last major action of the Crusade, and negotiations continued afterwards. Finally, on September 2nd, 1192, a deal was reached. Three years of truce was agreed. Saladin retained control of Jerusalem, but agreed to allow Christian pilgrims to access the Holy Sepulchre. The Frankish Crusaders were to hold the narrow coastal strip between Jaffa and Tyre, but Ascalon's fortifications would once again be destroyed. Key Crusaders such as the sickly Richard the Lionheart, Henri of Champagne, and Balian of Ibelon swore their oaths, followed by Saladin and key members of his family. With these rituals completed, peace was finally achieved. In the month that followed, three delegations of Crusaders made the journey to Jerusalem unopposed. They had achieved in peace what they could not achieve through war. After 16 months of fighting in the Holy Land, the Lionheart finally departed back to Europe on October 9, 1192. 
His opponent, Saladin, ruled his empire for around another half year, before dying on March 3rd, 1193. This defender of Islam was buried in the Grand Mosque at Damascus, where he remains to this day. Thus ends our series on the history of the Third Crusade, but as always we have more stories to tell, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.